Good Monday afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy new year to you all. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. As we uh, launch into 2021, we bring hope and optimism uh, that we look forward to a uh, better year this year. Uh, uh, you know, on the horizon is uh, a vaccine rollout that we hope will get to, uh, to all of us uh, uh, expeditiously as possible uh, throughout the year. So please be patient, and uh, we look forward to uh, 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 a better year this year with uh, some hope and determination and some patience. Uh, we're going to get through this and hopefully get to some sense of normalcy towards the end of the year. I hope that's the plan. I I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Elizabeth Richardson, our medical officer of health, and Paul Johnson, the Emergency Operations Center director, uh, who are going to give us some uh, detailed information around uh, cases and some city issues that uh, are still happening. And as you know, we are uh, currently in the grade lockdown category of the uh, province's recommended required lockdown. Uh, and that response framework uh, started on December the 21st. Uh, I remember that in uh, a reminder that in grade lockdown, there are no uh, indoor organized public events or social gatherings allowed except for members of the same household. Individuals who live alone, including seniors, may consider having exclusive close contact with another household to help reduce the negative impacts of social isolation. A maximum of 10 people can gather together outdoors uh, in an organized public event or social gathering. Uh, there will be no indoor or outdoor dining. There will only be takeout, drive-through, and delivery options, and we encourage you to continue to support your local restaurants uh, as much as possible, that uh, most of them are, are uh, curbside delivery uh, opportunities, and uh, certainly their support is very much appreciated. Retail will be open for curbside pickup or delivery only. In-person retail shopping is, uh, by and large, not permitted, with exceptions, of course, for essentials like supermarkets, hardware stores, pharmacies, and other essentials. So under this, as well as the uh, in the provincial lockdown, all of us should stay home as much as possible and only leave home when it is necessary. And necessary would be for work, uh, to get groceries, prescriptions uh, that you need, or your medical appointments. We want you to continue to do all of that, uh, but limited to all of that and do it alone if you can in all instances if possible. As well, we're asking our HSR customers to use the bus for essential travel only. So please save the space for essential workers and those who need to travel at this time. Uh, it's very important that they get to the access to the, uh, the service. Uh, there's no need to be taking the, the bus just to, to, to move around the city uh, unless you absolutely need it to get to work or get to healthcare or have the job that you're doing in terms of providing care to other people. So please continue to follow the public health, health advice, stay home. Limit your activity outside the home to essential activities only. Wear your mask as much as humanly possible. Wear, wash your hands and keep, keep your distance from one another. You know, if you have any COVID-19 symptoms or are not feeling well, stay isolated at home and get tested for COVID-19. The good news is that the test and test results happen much more quickly now. And, um, you know, it won't be long before you get your test results uh, back to you and you'll have some comfort of knowing whether you are or you aren't uh, COVID-19. So Hamilton, please do your part. Trust the experts. Continue to follow all of those important recommendations from our public health team. And we will continue to work together to get through this and on to a better place uh, in, the, in the coming months. I'm now going to pass it over to our Emergency Operations Center Director, Paul Johnson, for some additional information about Hamilton Impacts. Paul? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and Happy New Year to you. Uh, we start the new year with uh, a continued uh, reality of, of large numbers of cases in our community, and the community spread of, of COVID-19 is, uh, is obviously having an impact not only on you know, individuals within the community, but uh, those who work in other environments. Uh, we have a number of outbreaks that I know that uh, Dr. Richardson is going to talk about, and I'll touch on a couple that are related to uh, city business as well. Uh, but there's no doubt that uh, we, are, we are not yet on top of uh, this growing number of cases and really encouraging people to uh, remember all of the rules that uh, we're to follow in terms of uh, what we can and cannot uh, engage in and be involved in, particularly in our social activities. 
and remembering very, very strongly encouraging everybody uh, and imploring everyone to follow the public health measures uh, in your workplace, in your social activities, when you're out in the community. And this is the way that we can, we can stop this spread. Uh, from an enforcement perspective, over the holidays, we were very busy. Uh, nearly 200 complaints were received between uh, uh, Christmas Eve and uh, this weekend. And uh, those were the complaints related to COVID-19. And we issued a number of charges. And you will have seen some of those uh, displayed on our website. Uh, but we were also called to a number of private residences, which we do not display on our website, uh, with house parties. Uh, we were uh, called to establishments that were holding small gatherings for people, uh, all of which are not allowed under these uh, uh, under the gray category that we're in at the moment, and all of which resulted in some charges being laid. And you will have noticed that uh, one of the establishments that, uh, that was uh, listed on our website uh, indicated, of course, that they were close to the public. Well, gatherings and being close to the public doesn't change our enforcement. And in fact, in the case of that Tim Hortons, uh, a number of staff people were gathered inside, uh, 15 people. It was over capacity. They were not wearing masks and there was not uh, the proper physical distancing in place. So whether the establishment is open to the public or closed to the public uh, does not uh, mean that we can't still attend. And uh, if there are infractions, under our bylaws or under the Reopening Ontario Act that we can take action with that. And I think that's a good reminder for businesses as well. Just simply closing your doors to the public uh, does not turn that space into an area where social gatherings can, can occur, even if it's within uh, your staff uh, teams at the, uh, at the location. So uh, lots of activity over the holidays, which is worrying because that means for all the activity that we were alerted to, the complaints that came in and we thank the community for that, um, there were probably others that we weren't called to and we don't know about. These are the types of activities that do have the opportunity for the spread of this virus in our community. And that is certainly, uh, I know what Dr. Richardson is gonna comment on as well, is still what we're seeing as happening in our community as well. Do you wanna address outdoor ice rinks and ask uh, kindly if uh, folks can stay off the outdoor ice rinks when they're not in operation? We do have a booking system, which is really easy to, to access for folks, and uh, they are open for extended hours, 10 a.m. till 9 p.m. Outside of those hours, please do not uh, get on the ice uh, and, and do what you need to do. The, the reality is, is we're getting a lot of complaints about it. We had to attend. Um, these things will be closed down if we can't maintain them as safe operations, and it would be an absolute shame for that to happen. We want to, as the City of Hamilton, provide outdoor activities that are safe, but when, uh, when, when folks are, are abusing that privilege outside of the time when we have staff there to ensure that everything is being done safe and we have to attend in terms of coming there and uh, trying to shoot people off the ice surface, reality is when it's closed, it's closed. So please stay off those uh, outdoor rinks and please book and come as often as you can in terms of the booking uh, scenarios. Uh, and as I say, it was great just before the holidays for us to announce some extended hours there, but we are seeing some of these things occur and uh, we would like to encourage people not to use these at all uh, when our staff are not present and these facilities are not open. So uh, again, this is a, a, a time over the next few weeks when we really have to uh, both follow the rules in terms of where we should be going and how we should be not gathering in terms of any indoor um, gatherings. Uh, and not gathering in large numbers on an outdoor capacity as well. And really just finding ways to spend time with those who are in our household, the limited activities. Uh, if they're outdoors, do them in safe ways in, in areas that are truly open for you. And we can all get through this next period of time, get on top of these cases and stop the spread that happens into workplaces by people getting it in the community. And as you will see on our website, and I'm sure Dr. Richardson may comment on is that there is an outbreak in one of the long-term care facilities that is uh, operated by the city of Hamilton, including a number of residents and, uh, and staff members. Uh, that has meant that we will be implementing uh, controls and already have uh, uh, almost eliminating all uh, visits uh, by, by out outside individuals into the homes, only in very extreme circumstances uh, will people be allowed to come in and visit and, and be with their loved ones. And so for those with loved ones at Macassa Lodge, it is, um, 
Uh, these are trying times and I know that uh, you're anxious. Uh, our staff have been doing a tremendous job in trying to communicate as best they can with all the family members over the weekend. And we have uh, implemented every control measure that uh, we can take in order to ensure that, uh, that the virus uh, goes no further in, in our long-term care facility. And so just like every other facility uh, in the community, when it comes to the municipally run long-term care facilities, we take our job very seriously on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, the team over the course of the weekend has been working hard to make sure that they can adjust and do what they need to do uh, to keep everybody safe. Uh, we do know that this will be a very difficult time for those with loved ones who reside at Macassa Lodge. Uh, we will do everything we can to ensure that we can keep you updated around that, uh, but to recognize that for the safety for everybody, some of these measures that will uh, cause people not to be able to attend and see their relatives and their loved ones with the same frequency are there for everyone's protection. Most importantly, the vulnerable seniors that call Macassa Lodge home. With that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Richardson. Thanks very much, Paul. And uh, I'll add my Happy New Year's to everybody as well. So today um, I'll talk first about the case details a little bit and then talk about vaccine. So we're at 6,579 cases today in, in uh, Hamilton in total. That's uh, 94 new cases from yesterday. Our number of cases consist cases consistently continues to rise um, in our area with us now at a seven day moving average of cases of 136 and our weekly incidence rate is now at 161 per 100,000 population. So um, we are not showing signs of peaking or flattening out here in Hamilton. We have seen that in other parts of the province that they have had um, some flattening out in some areas or areas that still have lower incidence rates. But but for us here in Hamilton, we're very much still on a steep, uh, the steep part of the curve in terms of our incident rate. Um, you'll see that there's 1,603 active cases for Hamilton. I will note that with the volume of cases that we are coming through for our public health staff, we're very much working on a prioritized pace, basis in terms of case and contact management and focusing on the highest risk situations and the highest risk cases and their contacts uh, in places such as you know our long-term care homes and those sorts of settings. And um, so we may not be clearing our active case uh, numbers as quickly as we had in the past. We're now at 179 deaths to date with two new deaths reported today. Um, we're currently reporting a total of 32 local outbreaks, uh, including the one at Macassa Lodge, as well as a new one at Black at our Continuing Care Center. So as always, you can find more about our local COVID-19 case activity on our website. I do want to say that, again, with our, uh, our rising numbers, we're not seeing a peak. And so you're, we can expect to continue to see increasing case numbers, increasing numbers of outbreaks, and increasing strain on our healthcare system. Um, when I'm talking about hospitalizations, I'm talking about ICU utilization, and just reminding us all that we do act like a system. So we're affected not only by what happens here in Hamilton, but we're affected by what's happening around us as well. So our system does work to back up other parts of the province. Um, and so if, uh, if we have other areas that are under strain, they're turning to uh, other areas around them to help them as well. So they're affected by that as well. Um, you might have noticed over the holidays, just uh, there's a, one technical note that there were some instances when the daily counts were not uh, updating properly. We had a backlog happening with the labs um, uploading their data into the system. And that's been re repaired now for the time being. And any days, any times there's any of those sorts of delays, we'll always note those on the website. So in regards to the vaccine, so this is where the new year brings us um, some good news and some information. It is going to take us some time. There's going to be enough vaccine through the provincial and federal vaccine um, purchasing programs for anybody who wants a vaccine to get vaccinated. It's just that since uh, as we go forward with this, it's gonna take some time to produce all of that vaccine. And so as the vaccine is being produced, there's people that are going to be prioritized um, to get the vaccine first because they're the most vulnerable populations or they're those that serve those populations. So here in Hamilton, we kicked this off on December 23rd with our first vaccination clinic that we ran um, as a smaller clinic so we could you know, get down the logistics of, of uh, carrying this out. You can imagine in a world with COVID-19, there's a lot of personal protective equipment that needs to be worked out. We need to make sure people are spot properly spaced as they're coming in, as they're 
um, being vaccinated and as they're waiting, because you always need to wait after a vaccine for 15 minutes at least, a little longer if you're somebody who's had problems with allergies in the past. And so all of that needs to be worked out as well. We're working with a new information system, which the province had rapidly built, but it is um, one of those things that takes a, a little while to learn how to use and it's continuing to be updated by the provinces that gets better and better. So very much the focus is on moving this forward, getting shots into arms, um, and continuing to do it better and better as we go and get into uh, into larger numbers, get the vaccine to larger numbers. So this uh, this clinic that was launched at Hamilton Health Sciences, which is where the Pfizer vaccine has come into here in our community, um, it was launched uh, very much in the partnership way, which is the Hamilton way. So we had Hamilton Health Sciences people uh, running this clinic. We had people from St. Joseph's Hospital. We had primary care docs who were there. We had Hamilton paramedics who were there. We had public health people there. And we successfully have administered about 2,200 uh, vaccine doses so far. We did um, work right through the New Year's holiday and uh, they're seeing about 250 long-term care home workers per day and are planning to have that up to 500 per day this week with a goal of running a 12 hour per day, seven day per week clinic, uh, seeing more than a thousand people per day uh, by uh, into next week. So that's very good news in terms of it getting up and running and we're getting lots of, um, of support from our partners um, across all those agencies, as I noted. So far we've got, had come in about 6,000 doses of the Pfizer biotech, uh, biotech uh, vi vaccine. As you know, there was a change in policy as well. We were initially holding back that second dose um, so that we would have it to give the you know everybody who's been vaccinated. With the uh, vaccine supply now coming in quite regularly, the provinces said, okay, you can start to just put in vaccine that you're getting, giving it out to new people. Um, but being mindful that you need to make sure you're going to be able to give them the second dose, counting on the supply as it comes in. So that was good news. It allows us to, uh, again, with that expansion, start to get it into more arms. And we'll start doing the second dose for people that will start uh, next week, actually already, um, for those uh, who are due having had the first vaccine um, uh, appointments back on December 23rd. So we're very much working with the provincial government in terms of understanding the number of doses that come in, you know, what are the parameters there are, uh, there is, of course, another type of vaccine called Moderna, another mRNA vaccine, which we're um, hearing more about in terms of our local uh, distribution. We do um, understand we'll see that over the next couple of weeks. And that will allow us to then, because this is a vaccine that can get moved to other sites, whereas the Pfizer one right now cannot, um, that will allow an expansion of the vaccine program to those who actually live in um, long-term care homes and, and retirement homes. So that is hoped to begin uh, soon after the Moderna vaccine arrives here. The planning for that, of course, is already underway. Um, we have got up on the web a web page, uh, www.hamilton.ca backslash, or sorry, forward slash COVID vaccines. Uh, which is available. It has a lot of information on it and it's going to get updated as we continue to go forward. So it'd be great if you could all take a look at that um, and see what's there. There is a lot of information too about myth busting because there's lots of things as these new vaccines come into play that um, it's getting circulated through social media or through other venues. And so there's a lot of information there to, to sort of respond to some of the things that are coming through. So even though we've got all these vaccines coming in, it is absolutely um, an exciting time, but it's not a time to let our guard down. So even for those who have been vaccinated, but especially for those um, who are um, out and um, uh, not in long-term care homes, but living at home, all the members of the public, everybody who's going to work each day, those um, public health measures that we've talked about for so long continue to be so important and need to be practiced until we say that they can be um, backed off. And so that, again, is the, uh, the common sense measures of hand washing, um, your hygiene, coughing into your arm, all of those things, but also with our provincial lockdown, you know, our gatherings should be limited only to people in our household, maintaining a physical distance at all times. Um, if you're near anybody who's from outside of your household. So if you have a, a care worker who's coming in, you should still be maintaining distance as much as you can or a tutor or that sort of thing 
both masking if they do come into the home. All of those things continue to be very, very important. And of course, one of those things that's so important is staying home if you feel unwell at all. And as you've heard the mayor and Paul talk about, if you have the symptoms of COVID-19, do go out and get tested. We have those assessment centers continuing to run and um, those turnaround times on the tests are running reasonably well as well. So I'll look forward to continuing to provide you with more updates this year as the situation evolves. And for now, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you very much. Certainly a lot of information there and uh, a lot more information to be shared, I think, in terms of vaccine and timelines uh, as we go forward here. But the order of the day is that we need your continued determination to stay apart and uh, stay home as much as possible, even if you've had the vaccine. Uh, that is not an assurance that you may not carry the virus, as I understand it. And uh, clearly, uh, until such time as we get the all clear, we have the mass of uh, our population vaccinated, uh, will we still be in the kind of mode that we're in now in terms of masks and physical distancing and washing hands, etc. So it's about saving lives. It's about protecting our community. It's about uh, having an economy at the end of the day with healthy people that uh, can support that economy. Uh, we need to get through this portion portion of this struggle with this pandemic and uh, and there is hope and optimism that uh, there are better days ahead uh, once we get that vaccine into the arms of the majority of our population. And that's certainly uh, on its way. So that's good news. So please continue to follow the, uh, the very important advice of our public health officials. Uh, it is, uh, you know, now more important than ever, especially with the increasing case loads and, and you know, dramatically increasing amount of death, unfortunately. And, you know, I wasn't that long ago that we were talking about 40, 45 uh, individuals had passed away as a result of COVID. It's now jumped to 140 plus. Uh, that is a dramatic increase, uh, uh, unacceptable and is avoidable if we continue to follow the public health recommendations as much as humanly possible. So um, please keep doing it. So on behalf of uh, myself and, uh, and uh, Dr. Elizabeth and Paul Johnson and City Council, we still wish you a happy new year. It is going to be a better year than 2020 was. It's just gonna take us some time to get there. Jasmine, over to you for some media questions. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have eight media on the phone today. So we'll start with one question and one follow-up for each of you. First question to Fallon Hewitt from the Hamilton Spectator. Fallon, you can go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, this is for Paul Johnson. So like you had mentioned, a number of businesses were charged with hosting social gatherings and indoor gatherings, and you spoke to the situation at the Tim Hortons in Winona. Um, I guess, what does the city have to say about this kind of behavior in the midst of the second wave and the second lockdown? Unacceptable uh, is the best word I can use for it. Uh, you know, this isn't a case where people can say, hey, there's nothing going on in the community. We haven't seen a new case in three or four days. You know, come on, you guys are being a little too tough. Uh, you report on it as the media, and it's certainly out there, whether it's provincially, a number of times provincially, we have been mentioned as the top three or four uh, areas in the province in terms of new cases per day over the last couple of weeks. So to suggest that people don't know exactly how big a challenge it is from a, uh, from a spread of this community, uh, spread of this virus in this community, uh, I find that hard to believe. So, um, you know, again, there are lots of, of, of times where I'm sure people have, you know, tried really hard and just something, you know, they, something goes wrong here, but these are not cases where something is, uh, is just a miss for a couple of seconds or uh, uh, somebody didn't replace somebody at the door doing screening for a couple of minutes because they just got their wires crossed as a staffing unit. Uh, this is, uh, you know, gatherings where, where it's pretty clear. And now there's, there's, you know, before it was advice and the rules. And now it's just the rules, social gatherings inside, uh, outside of those members of your household are not allowed. They're actually not allowed. It's not advice. It's not good, good statements. It's not good, you know, uh, public health measures and all the rest. It's actually not allowed. And so if you're outside of your household, you're inviting people over, you're having those gatherings, 
uh, you know, you, you are, are breaking uh, the rules as laid out under the reopening Ontario Act. So at, at some point, you know, you have to stop making excuses. And I think people are still trying to find ways around things all the time. And I would encourage everybody to do what many people are doing, and that is sacrifice. And I feel really bad for those who are doing this really well, businesses and individuals who have made those personal sacrifices, have made those business sacrifices, and are now turning around and going, you know, what, what, what gives for the people who are making, you know, personal try and cheat here personally or cheat from a business perspective on the rules. And so um, uh, our, our comment is we're still going to be here to enforce. Uh, we can't be everywhere all the time, though. We know that. And uh, as I mentioned in my opening comments, um, we did uh, have the opportunity to work on some complaints that came in and messages from the public, which was great. And we did lay some charges and obviously uh, demand some compliance here and there. I also know that uh, the chances are of those being the only instances of when those occurs is pretty slim. So it does tell me that uh, people just aren't understanding this message and look at the outbreaks, look at where things are happening in our community right now. Uh, this is a very serious time for us. And there will come a point in 2021, I hope, where we'll be talking about loosening those uh, measures and loosening the, uh, the restrictions. It's going to come. It's not here on January the 4th. In fact, they need to be as tight as ever. And that would be my message is uh, for all those doing the right thing, keep talking to your colleagues, keep talking to your family and friends, and keep encouraging them to do what you're doing, which is the right thing. And hopefully we can see no more names added to that list of businesses where charges are laid and no more stories about individual residents that we're attending uh, where we're laying charges as well. Thank you. And then my follow up was that you mentioned that there were a number of calls to private residences over the holidays. And I know we reported on the one party on New Year's, but would you be able to tell us how many people were charged over the holidays? Were the attendees or just hosts? And what was the largest gathering the city saw in a private residence? Uh, so I won't be able to, to share, you know, what the largest is. I, I, I don't know that. Uh, we laid a total of 32 charges under the Reopening Ontario Act. Um, uh, we laid three uh, fines uh, for face covering violations. Uh, we did have some bylaw charges at, uh, at actually the Waterdown Memorial Park for after hours use. And we did attend with four noise bylaws, not related. Obviously, those are our usual ones we can lay, but we did it in concert with, uh, with all of our COVID enforcement as well. So that's sort of the size and scope. And, you, you know, again, we, we, we put those up on the web in terms of the total numbers that are there. And often when we're uh, attending, um, we, we both can issue to the homeowner or to the, uh, the organizer of the event, or we can issue uh, to those also in attendance. And it, uh, it depends on the situation and depends what's happening in there, whether that is usually done to the person who is hosting the gathering or whether it's done across the board to those who are also in attendance. But that gives you a little flavor of, of the type of enforcement we saw. And that's the range from um, uh, Christmas Eve through to uh, yesterday. So that, that gives you a sense of what happened over that period of time. Great. Thank you, Paul. Next question to Lisa Paleski from CHML. Lisa, you can go ahead. Hi, thanks very much and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, my question would be for Dr. Richardson. Um, you, you touched briefly on the Moderna vaccine and how that's going to be um, prioritized for the long-term care residents who can't travel to get the uh, Pfizer shot. Um, do you have any more concrete information about an ETA for when that will be in Hamilton? Is it still kind of you're waiting in the province? Um, as well as, do you know how that rollout will go? Will there be certain homes that will be prioritized to get the shot before others? Thanks, Lisa. Um, we don't have anything more specific than what I gave you in terms of timing. We know it'll be in the next couple of weeks, not this week, but sometime in the next couple of weeks. Um, in terms of prioritization, that's what we're working through right now. Part of that will include, you know, understanding the, the amount of vaccine that we're going to get. So we'll be looking at, you know, which are the highest risk homes that we have. So for example, we have some homes that still have four bedrooms um, where you have four people in one room, whereas newer facilities have, you know, just single bedrooms and that sort of thing. So those kind of criteria, are what's going to get looked at as we go forward. Okay, thanks. And um, the other kind of uh, question I had was about the uh, Premier saying that the vaccination program is going to be ramping up um, with a significant difference in the next few weeks. That seems to kind of be in line with what you've said about how you're hoping to, by next week, get to up about 
uh, 1,000 people vaccinated per day. Um, is there is again? This may be too soon to tell, but do we know how long it will take to start moving to vaccinating kind of other frontline workers outside of the healthcare system? Right, and those are good questions and questions we're all going to have. And so the province has, of course, released their framework, and that's the the framework that we're all working in in terms of the priority groups that we're vaccinating. So we know this first wave, the priority groups are seniors living in congregate settings, still so long-term care homes, retirement homes. We know that they're the workers that work in those those homes as well, in order to protect both the workers and the seniors, healthcare workers who are seeing people actively with COVID, providing them with intimate care. Those are priority groups. We know that first nation because of their living conditions are priority groups for the for the vaccine and as well people who have chronic disease because we know they're more likely to become hospitalized and to die um, of this illness especially those who are seniors so that's the first um, wave of people who are who the province has set out within their framework in terms of priorities and then we'll continue to march through that the once again we're looking at um, trying to reduce of course both the the rates of illness but also the rates of severe illness and death and so that's why that prioritization is happening in that way it's going to take us a year uh, to get this vaccine rolled out based on what the government understands in terms of the supplies and when they're coming in from the, the companies that are producing the vaccine and based on just the numbers that we have in uh, in each of our communities so that's kind of the time frame does that give you a, sort of the specifics you're looking for uh, yeah, it's basically kind of in line with what I expected. It Again, it's really up to the province at this point. So thank you. And just to add in terms of the 1,000 doses, so that's going to be 1,000 doses, doses of Pfizer anticipated to be up and running by, uh, by into next week. And then once we get the Moderna, that will be on top of that. And so you know, we'll continue to escalate um, beyond that 1,000 as soon as we get the Moderna vaccine. Great, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Next question to Adam Atkinson from CHCH. Adam, you can go ahead. Well, hi, this is for Dr. Richardson. Um, so you mentioned 179 deaths to date in Hamilton, two new ones today. Are you able to tell us how many of those deaths happened at long-term care homes and if the, the two new ones today uh, uh, were also at long-term care homes? Thanks very much, Adam. If you look on our website, the details around the deaths are broken out in two different ways. So on the website, you can see um, by long-term care home in terms of deaths and the outbreaks that are happening. And as well, we have it broken down by age group. So I don't have all those at my fingertips, but if you look on our website, there's um, a good chunk of data there around that. Okay. Follow-up question for that. Um, uh, Hamilton Health Sciences went into um, Grace Villa, I think, a couple weeks ago. What kind of work is being done by outside agencies to help at long-term care homes in the city? Yeah, there has been a lot of work to, and to support long-term care homes and retirement homes as well in our city. And so we do take, have a table where we have primary care hospitals, home and community care, um, are, you know, various groups that are working to support those congregate settings as well as other ones, as well as shelters and those sorts of settings. But the um, home and community care group does also access a number of agency supports as the homes do directly that can help them in terms of staffing in those settings. As well, we work with the two regulatory bodies, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, or sorry, the Ministry of Long-Term Care that uh, regulates the long-term care homes as well as the Retirement Homes Regulatory Authority who regulates the retirement homes. And so when we, um, have an outbreak that occurs. We have outbreak meetings with those, those regulatory agencies that are helping to support them. And if it looks like an outbreak that is going to need or a home that needs more staffing supports, more supports, then whether they're IPAC supports that we can provide or the hospitals can provide, or they are actual staffing supports that um, home and community care can provide or agencies can provide or the hospitals can come and provide, um, then we do all of those things. And where it's important to then move to um, regulatory sort of tools, as we call them, the, the orders that we can issue um, in order to give 
a, a direction for hospitals to come into long-term care homes to assist in providing care or the Ministry of Health um, to be able to do that. Sorry, the Ministry of Long-Term Care. It'll take me a long time to get um, switched over entirely to that, uh, that moniker. But for the Ministry of Long-Term Care to, to um, as well order homes to have supports from elsewhere, all of those things are being applied um, in various situations depending on the severity of the situation. Great, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Next question to Laura Howells from CBC. Laura, you can go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if you can provide any more detail about the uh, gatherings that were shut down at Derosa Bakery, Last Call Bar, and the Tim Hortons over the holiday uh, in terms of, you know, how many people were there, what was kind of going on at the time, and, and just more of a sense of sort of what, what was happening. Uh, so I can provide a little bit, uh, the full amount of detail. Uh, again, as you will know from our website, these are charges. Uh, they can be contested. And so uh, some of the, uh, the evidence as it is, we, uh, we ensure that uh, we're not going to through a, a course of, of, uh, of having these contested. But in terms of the last, car, last call bar, um, my understanding is this was a New Year's Eve celebration, um, small number of people, but um, again, uh, they were uh, not to be uh, hosting this type of social gathering. And so a total of five charges were issued to the people inside at uh, the bakery, uh, DeRosa Bakery. It was people gathering inside, uh, I think, to have a, a social event around a sporting uh, event that was on television. Uh, there was no physical distancing, no masks, and all of the individuals were from different households. And so that resulted in uh, several charges as well. So those are the kinds of, of things that were happening. Um, and at Tim Hortons, it was a staffing gathering uh, that was occurring, but it was social in nature. And so it, um, although it was closed to the public, uh, and this was not a case where um, where we had re we had public in there as well. Uh, again, this was a social gathering, um, uh, not allowed. And there was also uh, overcapacity, not wearing masks and having uh, no physical distancing. So those were the types of things that were going on in those cases. And again, um, you know, all ways of of getting around what every what many many other people uh, are sacrificing. Uh, I'm. I'm a huge sports fan, as those of you who know me uh, know very well. I would love to be having people over to watch games, and I'm pretty sure that I would be able to figure out ways to do it safely. But the bottom line is it's not allowed. So I watch the games on my, on my own and uh, wait for a better day where we can get together and watch the college football uh, playoffs and all sorts of things with uh, with friends and, and have it as a social event. So we're all making those sacrifices. I'm not using that to make me out to be any better than anyone else, but I'm just saying that I understand the, the what people want to do. I understand people are making sacrifices. It's something we need to do universally until we can get these numbers down. We will start then to re look at re uh, releasing those restrictions and people, uh, you know, the province will have uh, good information to move us into a better color category. Uh, we locally will have better information and Dr. Richardson will help uh, encourage us, I know, to be more together whenever we can be, but we're not at that stage yet. And so follow the rules. And uh, clearly in those situations, uh, the rules weren't being followed. Thank you. Um, and following that, uh, can you provide more information about um, the fines issued? Um, was everyone in these cases issued the $880 social gathering fine and were any of the organizers issued the uh, maximum $10,000 fine? Uh, my understanding is that, uh, that we did not issue the $10,000 uh, fine, so they would be in the uh, 880 variety. Uh, there may have been some cases along the way in some of these instances where they were uh, other fines as well because uh, they were related not to the uh, Reopening Ontario Act, but to uh, our masking bylaws which uh, and, and others which have different levels of fines. But I, I don't believe there was any $10,000 fine handed out in, in these cases. I will make sure that we confirm that with you for sure. But uh, that's the information I have in front of me. Great. Thank you, Paul. Next question to Stephanie Murata from the Globe and Mail. Stephanie, you can go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my question and Happy New Year. 
So today, Toronto announced that it'll begin publicly naming workplaces with outbreaks. And that's something that has been quite controversial across public health units in Ontario. Hamill's been the only region to publicly name businesses with outbreaks. So when did you start naming workplace outbreaks and why did you make the decision to do so? Hi there. Thanks for that. Uh, we named the workplaces an outbreak from the very first workplace that had an outbreak here in Hamilton. Um, aside from uh, hospitals and long-term care homes, which had already, of course, retirement homes had outbreaks before that, and were also being named. So, you know, we've had a long-standing um, sort of understanding here in Hamilton about how we'll we'll um, share information of that sort with the media, with the public um, here in Hamilton. This is something that has gone on for many, many years. And uh, we have tended to share, uh, be at the higher end in terms of sharing information. We've had lots of discussions with privacy and our, the privacy commissioner as well about exactly where that line is between uh, protecting people's uh, private information, protecting confidentiality and providing the public um, and the media um, who get it out to the public with the information that they need to understand the risks and where um, we're seeing issues. So this was already very much where we were at as an organization in our relationship with the community and with the media. And so when um, we had our first workplace outbreak, which was later, fortunately, than, than many other parts of the, of the province, we made the decision quickly to go ahead and provide information um, with that outbreak. It was uncomfortable, I'm sure, for um, those workplaces at the beginning being the first um, as they happened here and with nobody else having um, had that information out, but it has been fair and equitable in that we share that um, around all of those outbreaks. So there, there is occasionally a, a situation where naming an individual, um, naming an outbreak and naming the fact that it exists could pinpoint an individual and, and end up compromising privacy. And so in those very limited cases, uh, we may not do that. And so you may recall that that did happen, for example, with a sports group who had an outbreak, but otherwise we share that information. Thank you. And that's sort of a, a two-part follow-up question here. So we've heard from other regions that there are several barriers to publicly naming workplace outbreaks and that as a result, they have opted to not disclose. So I'm curious from you, what benefits and or challenges have you seen after months of naming these businesses? And I'm also wondering, um, you mentioned that you had a number of discussions with the province's privacy commissioner, commissioner to sort through the boundaries of this. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what sort of discussions you needed to have? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, as I said, this this is something that every agency needs to to think through and work through. And because of our, you know, the way Hamilton operates, we've had those discussions over the years. So this has been something that's evolved over many years here in Hamilton. It, it's, uh, you know, something that we tackled long before. And so thinking about, you know, some of those challenges and benefits, you know, some of the challenges are for the workplaces, it can be really tough when they're the, the single uh, workplace who is named or the beginning of the of you know what has continued to be a number of, of outbreaks unfortunately that have gone on um, so I'm sure that it has been we've heard that it's been uh, a tough for those workplaces but as the field becomes unfortunately more level as others get named then there's not as much um, you know of a stigma that is potentially attached to it for us from an information perspective um, it causes us a fair amount of work I mean getting the information um, cleaned, generated, you always want to provide the most accurate information you possibly can. You don't want to make any slip ups. And so that takes a lot of our epidemiologists, our analysts to make sure all of that information is there. And you'll know that we provide this too on the on the um, inspections and orders uh, front. And you'll see our IPAC inspections are up, up uh, now on our website. There's all kinds of pieces. So it takes a lot of work um, in order to do that. But as a consequence, People are, are well informed um, in terms of what is going on here, what we see. There's always an ask for more information and we're always looking at what we might do or, or what and what's doable and where the balance is both on that public health side. And that's where some of the challenges come into in terms of just trying to walk up that very important line about maintaining confidentiality, maintaining people's privacy while providing the information that people um, can have in order to understand the risks and understand what's going on as this evolves out in the community. So when it came to the privacy commissioner, a lot of the discussions were about that, about where were those boundaries? What was the difference between naming numbers um, versus naming people by age, naming people by where they lived, you know, all of those sorts of things about where were the parameters 
around what could be discussed were there. And so that is why you will see in some limited um, uh, areas where we won't give any details. And that causes a lot of angst because people are used to getting a lot of information from us and, and they wonder what's going on and it makes it feel a little bit like we're being secretive. But um, there are those, those circumstances where if we provide more details, people will, will know who it is. They'll know who it is at their school. They'll know who it is at their workplace. And that compromising people's uh, health information is, uh, is not something we would do. Great, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Next question to Maria from the Hamilton Spectator. Maria, you can go ahead. Hi there. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about, um, sorry, Dr. Richardson, um, the two biggest outbreaks that we're seeing um, in the city with Grace Villa and Shalom Village. Um, both of these homes are saying that their staffing levels are stable and they don't need additional help uh, from the outside, including from the Red Cross. I wanted to ask, what's your assessment of the situation in those homes, especially as we're continuing to see deaths? And do you think more help is needed? Hi, Maria. Definitely, these homes have been something that have been a challenge over the last many weeks and working, um, you know, with both the homes and the Ministry of Long-Term Care, uh, the hospitals who have been involved with them, um, you know, everybody's been working to support them. And there have been times when we've talked about, are there other resources that could come in from elsewhere, but they've been able to manage um, as they go. Certainly bringing in people from elsewhere to support is not without its own sets of complexities as people come to understand our system and, and how to work within these particular institutions. And as we've been learning from other jurisdictions where the Red Cross has gone in, we've been getting prepared um, should it be needed in order to make sure that you know, we're asking the right questions, getting the right information. And we know our colleagues in Niagara have had that experience, our colleagues uh, further to the West have as well. And so we're certainly getting prepared if they're needed, but we rely on the hospital, uh, on the, the sites, I should say, the hospitals, if they're involved in them and the ministry, that's really the staffing element is really up to them in terms of making decisions about staffing. We're not, we're not experts in clinical care um, in, uh, in those sorts of settings, they are. Um, and so they're the primary decision makers in those areas. And we work to support them and point out where we see issues that where staffing might help, you know, whether it's overall resident health, whether it's uh, ability to follow IPAC measures, all of those sorts of things. And so that's, uh, that's where, where our role plays out there. Thank you. And then for, to follow up, uh, with respect to the distribution of uh, vaccination. So I know you spoke about uh, the Moderna vaccine earlier. Uh, I'm wondering specifically about staff vaccinations and how uh, long-term care homes are chosen for that. For example, like I understand that Shalom Village had um, last week at least 10 staff who are being vaccinated per day. So I wanted to ask what factors go into determining how spaces like that are uh, spread out across the homes when it comes to staff. Sure, I think I, I think I got you. I've missed a little bit. I think of the question again, Maria. But um, the so what we're able to do is do about ten to fifteen percent of any home on any given day in any case because of the fact that you know the staffing levels that are required to run these homes are significant, and we know that there's you know people may indeed have side effects for a, a day or two that may actually keep them off work. And so we don't want to end up in, in destabilizing, you know, any of the homes because of the vaccination program either. And so we're slowly working through getting them vaccinated over time. Um, so that's part of it is just that ability to vaccinate about 10 to 15% of, of people each day. And of course, the, the tighter a home is on staffing, the, you know, the fewer people will actually be able to, to come and, uh, and get vaccinated on any given day. As well, we are also working through that piece about who's the highest risk, um, again, in terms of the characteristics of the home. And, uh, and so those are also being taken into account. Um, so the, the first few days, they, you know, were able to mount up with a few homes. But as we've gone forward, we've been widening up that to more and more homes so that they can come through and get their staff vaccinated, knowing that this is going to be, you know, a logistical piece that goes on now for many, many weeks as we bring people through and then they'll need to come through again for their second dose at that 21 day mark. So it, uh, it is going to take us some time. Great, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Next question to Matt Ingram from CHCH. Matt, you can go ahead. 
Hey everyone, thanks for taking my question. Happy New Year. Um, I have a question on behalf of my colleague, Lisa Hefner. Um, Ontario is last in the country on a per capita basis for distributing vaccines. We were wondering, uh, Dr. Richardson, if you might have some insight in, intel on uh, why that has been a challenge in Ontario. Sorry, I'm not sure if it's my headset today, but I didn't hear the very first part. Sorry, I said uh, uh, Ontario has been uh, is last of all the provinces on a per capita basis for delivery of vaccine. And I was wondering uh, if you could perhaps give us some insight on why it's been such a challenge to deliver vaccine to individuals. Thanks very much. I, I don't think I can give you sort of the provincial overview. I think you really have to turn to the province. To, to ask about that. I can just sort of reflect on the issues locally in terms of getting us done. And so, you know, absolutely we need the vaccine supply in order to get that there. And so here in Hamilton, you know, we started with our first doses came in. Uh, I ended up arriving a little earlier um, than we'd perhaps uh, been expecting them and we're um, then able to get a clinic off the ground very quickly and, uh, and start the pilot in phase. And it's a bit complex to get those pilots, those clinics up and running, as I described to you in terms of the logistics and that sort of thing. But nonetheless, they need to get going and they need to get uh, get ramped up. And so our colleagues at Hamilton Health Sciences have been working very hard to get them up and going to get an increased number of people um, through those sites. Um, you know that health human resources in Ontario, the hardest time to vaccinate people during a pandemic is when we're at the peak of cases. And unfortunately, that's where we are. We're at the peak of cases. You know, we're, we're still rising in terms of that peak. We have, you know, rising numbers of outbreaks. They require lots of people to be working in, in the homes, especially when they're in outbreaks. We have our hospitalizations, our ICU levels are high. And so we're really tapped um, in terms of health human resources. And so that's part of the challenge as well. But nonetheless, we're gonna to continue to work really hard to get as many of those doses out as soon as possible after they arrive. Certainly some of the rules piece as well about hold back half because they were concerned about would we be able to have that second dose and would it you know, end up in those first doses just being wasted because we didn't have second doses to come in right afterwards. Now we're confident on our supply. And so now we can start opening up further. So that's sort of the, the, the basis that we've been planning on and, uh, and we'll just keep working at it. I can tell you there's a, a group right across the city who is working on it uh, so that we can get it rolling out as soon as possible. Are you concerned about the slow pace and is it something that you're having conversations with the province about? Oh, we have conversations with the province about vaccinations about twice a day, every day, <laughs> as a minimum, some days more often. Um, and we have conversations locally uh, once or twice a day, every day about vaccines um, uh, and how we can get these going. There are working groups from, as I said, across the hospitals, primary care, um, long-term care, and then looking forward at, at those other target groups that we've been talking about. We're working with them. There's a there's a stakeholder meeting that will be happening tomorrow to talk about how we move these things out. So we are talking about it, but most important, importantly, we're getting those plans down. We've got people who are putting vaccines into arms. We're going to continue to expand that up so that we can get as many doses as possible out the door as soon as we possibly can. Great, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Mr. Mayor, that's the end of our media questions for today, so I will pass things back to you. Okay, thank you, Jasmine, and thank you to our uh, media partners for continuing to uh, share important information with the broader community. And uh, we, will, we know that this will uh, continue as we work our way through to uh, vaccinations and uh, hopefully a better, better outcomes in the, uh, in the future. So keep working at it. We need uh, very much to have you continue to do the work that you're doing in our broader community. It's uh, critically important. I want to thank uh, Bill Custers and the entire team at Cable 14, as well as Clear Cable, uh, all of whom helped to put these uh, media availabilities together and make sure that they run smoothly. And uh, of course, uh, a reminder again to, uh, this is a critical time. Uh, this is not the time to relax. Uh, we're shut down for a reason, and that is to avoid the spread of this virus. And that uh, that uh, that avoidance will help get the case numbers down. Will uh, avoid uh, you know uh, increasing death in our community, and will uh, help improve uh, the uh, the ICU care and hospital care that uh, is so critically important. So please continue to follow the advice of our public health officials. And if you need additional information in terms of supports for individuals financially or businesses, 
and or you know additional information around vaccines or the virus as we uh, kind of roll it out, go to our website, hamilton.ca slash coronavirus. An awful lot of information in there in terms of uh, all of the issues surrounding COVID and the supports that are available to you as well as you uh, continue to work through this with us to get to a better place. Uh, our next media briefing is on January the 11th uh, at 3 p.m. And so we, uh, we look forward to bringing you new and additional information at that point. And finally, to our Orthodox uh, friends in the community, uh, it is Orthodox Christmas this Thursday, January the 7th. I'd like to wish our Orthodox Christians in Hamilton a very Merry Christmas and remind you to please also celebrate this holiday virtually to help us stop the uh, spread of COVID in our community. And on that note, we will uh, hopefully ask you to stay safe, stay apart as much as humanly possible, uh, be patient and be kind to uh, all of our support workers out there, whether it's grocery store clerks or uh, transit operators, uh, they're all doing their best to get get you where you need to be or get you what you need to have. And so uh, patience is critically important. And let's stay focused on uh, getting through this portion of our pandemic exercise so that we can get to a better place. Thank you all very much. And we'll see you on the uh, next media advisory.